Hey guys, welcome back to New Digs. We're here in Melissa's garden in June and we're going to talk about five jobs you want to do this time of year in your ornamental beds. So let's get started. So job number one for this time of year is deadheading. And all that means is cutting off flowers that have died, that have already bloomed and died on a plant. And there are a bunch of reasons that you'd want to do that. One would be just for aesthetic reasons. You want the plant to look better. You don't want dead flowers hanging around on the plant. A second reason is that, and this is particularly for perennials, you don't want them to waste time setting seed. You don't want the flowers to turn into seeds. A third reason, which may seem a little bit um, counterintuitive, is that you want a plant uh, to produce a second flush of bloom. Meaning if I take off the dead flowers, some perennials in particular will go ahead and produce a whole new flush of bloom later in the season. And that's actually a really good reason to, to buy certain plants. Um, finally, you can deadhead if a plant is looking a little stressed and you want it to put energy back into the whole system instead of wasting time setting seeds. So I'm going to show you some examples of all those things in my ornamental gardens. So I'm going to show you how to deadhead this, this lilac. And this is a beautiful French lilac that I just put in last year. It flowered beautifully this year. The reason I'm cleaning this up is simply to make it look better. Um, when, when you have a huge lilac on your property, you clearly are not going to spend time on a ladder um, pruning off all the dead blossoms. But in a shrub this size, I can do it. And I'm just going to go back to a spot where um, the flower grew out of the stem and I'm just going to cut it back. It's always good, um, gardeners, um, budding gardeners should know, it's always good to have some sort of a container that you lug around with you in the garden when you're working. Throw weeds in it, throw cuttings in it. It makes you far more likely to do what Joel was talking about in our vegetable video, which is to, to kind of deadhead and weed as you go instead of making it into a big, big production. So this is pretty straightforward. Prune in the lilac and it'll just look much, much more um, attractive. A second type of deadheading that I do in my garden um, is in my annual containers. And this is a beautiful one that I, I just did uh, maybe three weeks ago. And this dahlia, you can see, um, a couple of the flowers have already passed. So I just want to get right down to where the flower comes out, clip it off, and the reason I'm doing that, as you can see, it's setting new buds already. So by taking these off, it's less for the plant to maintain on the top, and it gives it more energy to put back into producing new buds and flowers to keep the container looking fresh. In the case of this verbena, it's also starting to look just a little bit ratty. I can either just pinch those, or I can cut them off, and that's again going to stimulate new growth on this container. I'll probably also feed it, uh, which we're going to talk about a little bit later. I'm also going to deadhead this iris. I had a large clump of these. I divided them last year and replanted them. So I didn't have a huge flush of bloom, but I did get a couple of blossoms. This is a plant that does not benefit from leaving spent blossoms on the plant. This would not go to seed. Um, it's not really how you reproduce it. So this is something I would always, always deadhead. And it just looks so much fresher and cleaner getting these things off. This is a brand new woodland garden that literally has only been established for about a month. And um, the idea here is I want this to be a very informal bed. Uh, that's what's, what's going to look best here under these trees. So these are shade loving perennials for the most part. And I want to create lots of new plants from the ones I already have. One way to do that is to not deadhead and let the plant go to seed and produce new baby plants. Um, now, I won't see any of that activity until next spring, and I'll have to remember what's in here uh, so that I can recognize the seedlings. But there are a lot of plants in here that I know um, from research will seed themselves and create colonies. So um, I'm going to show you some examples of things that I probably will not deadhead. Many of you may recognize the columbine. It's, it's a really staple spring plant of a woodland garden. And these are the seed pods. Columbines can be really prolific seeders. So I wanna leave this guy alone, let the seed pods ripen, and then the seeds will disperse in the area. It's very easy to recognize um, the babies in the spring because the leaf is so distinctive. So that one I'm not gonna deadhead. 
In addition, these are some beautiful candelabra primroses, and I have always admired these, and I finally have a woodland moist garden where they will thrive. You see they're still blooming in June. Down here, these are all the spent blossoms and the seed pods. I know that these will uh, seed themselves, and it's called naturalizing. You basically want nature to spread the seeds um, so that they germinate where they land, and it, it just creates a very informal natural effect in the woodland garden. Number two on our list is the Chelsea Chop. The Chelsea Chop. This is a term I had literally never heard before. I guess I'm not watching as many British gardening shows <laughs> as you are. Um, but Jill is going to demonstrate what the Chelsea Chop is and why it helps us in the garden. Okay. So what is the Chelsea Chop? The Chelsea Chop is when you take certain perennials, this is a phlox, um, it works very well with phlox, um, anything that's really late season that's not a woody plant, that's a very herbaceous plant, um, what it is, is taking a big chunk of it. I'm going to just grab it down here and I'm going to take half of it off. I'm going to take a little bit more and maybe do it a little higher up. And a little more, maybe even a little higher. And what this is going to do is it's going to stagger the heights of the, the bloom and it's going to stagger when the bloom happens. In this particular instance, we've got this beautiful Empress Wu back here that we don't want to completely uh, block. It's, it's a beautiful plant. So if the, we let these go to their full height, they're going to completely block it out. But if we take down part of it to a lower height and some even a little lower, What's going to happen is there, it's going to open it up. It's going to make it so these bloom first, and then the, the, the next, next ones will be these, and then these. And it'll bloom longer. It'll make a shorter, bushier plant and a more appealing effect. And in this case, not block out things that are happening in, in the background. So plants you can do the Chelsea Chop on. Flocks are perfect for that. It, Flox really benefit from that also because it helps with um, not getting the powdery mildew because it opens it up a little bit so you get more air circulation. So phlox love that. Echinaceas, uh, daisies, most things that are sort of in that late blooming daisy family. So experiment with it and see how you like it, but the Chelsea Chop is something to do in June. A third job that you should be doing at this time of year is weeding, staying on top of the weeds. And unfortunately, this is, is not one of my, my fortes. But in my defense, in my woodland garden, um, because it's informal and because it, it does kind of transition into the woods, weeding can be a real problem, especially across this back area. Now, why do we weed? We weed for a couple of reasons. One is that we, we want to feature the, um, the plants that we've, we've purchased and that we've planted here. There's an old saying that a weed is just a plant out of place. Now, take that with a grain of salt. Um, the other thing is that weeds are notorious for being able to spread very quickly, and so sometimes they, they can be invasive. We want a weed because they are competition for the plants that we want in the garden. Every weed has a root system and it's soaking up moisture and it's soaking up nutrients from the plants that we want. So that's why it's important um, to get weeds out. Now in this bed, um, because I want it to naturalize, it's going to be especially important to stay on top of weeding and this is, this is going to be trouble for me. But I'm in this little area in the, the transition between the woods that I'm not going to be gardening in and the garden itself. And along this border I planted spring bulbs last year. Um, this is another thing that you can be deadheading now. I planted them back here on purpose because I didn't want the, the ugly foliage at this point in the season to be out in the front of the garden. So this is the, along deadheading lines. Cut these off so that the plant is just um, putting energy into the bulb, just like the garlic that we talked about in our vegetable video. But this whole patch here is weeds. and. There, fortunately, it's, uh, it has rained recently, so it's very, very easy to pull these out. That's always a good idea when you're weeding, is, is to either water or wait until after it's rained. So I'm just gonna pull all these out, and I do not want to throw them 
back in the woods because they probably would be able to reseed. This is called Colt's Foot. This is all over the place. It's actually a beneficial um, weed, but I don't know how to use it, so it's, it's going out of my garden. So in this case, I'm just gonna pull it out. I can also use a cultivator, which is one of those, um, looks like a little hand rake um, to stir things up, but sometimes if weeds have gone to seed, it stirs up more weed seeds, um, so you're better off just pulling the plants directly up. So tip number four involves feeding. And early in the season, I put down a granular slow release fertilizer in all of my flower beds. Um, there's a product that Espoma makes that I really recommend. There's a flower tone and a plant tone, and they're both granular. You can even just kind of hand spread them. However, feeding is something that you have to stay on top of all season. And now in June, some things are, are starting to show signs of eating food. I'm standing here in a bed that looks pretty good. And in a second, I'm gonna show you a parallel bed. It's, it's mate on the other side of my garden gate. Uh, and you'll see the difference. And one issue is compost. Uh, you try to enrich the soil as much as possible with compost. Early in the season, this bed got the bumper crop of compost. That bed got cheated. And you're gonna see the difference, especially in the annual impatience uh, on the other side of the bed. Notice the yellowing, the yellowing foliage on these impatiens. Now, there could be a number of, of causes of that. The most likely one in this case is that they, are, they need to be fed. Um, it could be from getting too much water. They may just not like this situation. But the yellowing foliage here, um, as opposed to here where this is a natural color, the chartreuse is a natural color. This is not supposed to be that color. It's supposed to be a green leaf. So I'm going to get out my fish and seaweed emulsion and give those guys a drink this afternoon. Now, if you've watched some of our videos, you may remember my set of three containers from earlier this season, and you can see that they really are flourishing. Um, even the spring plants that I was mentioning I might need to swap out are, are doing great. I did deadhead the um, Tiarella here that I mentioned was a perennial. It had white foamy flowers. They were starting to look spent, cut those off. These plants, um, as I said, I've really been on top of fertilizing. Imagine if you're a plant living in a container. The only access you have to food and water are, are what's contained within those walls. So every time I water, I'm leaching out nutrients and food. The plants can't gather it from elsewhere in their environment. So I have to feed them. And you can see how, how um, well they're doing and how they're really thriving in what's a very, very hot uh, spot in my driveway. So it shows that they really are, they, they're happy and they're thriving. So our fifth tip is assessing your garden. June is a great time to just take a walk around and make some mental notes. And if you have the wherewithal, even to keep a little garden notebook of, of things that you wanna do. And this would be things like a plant that you think you wanna move. Maybe um, you want, in my case, you can see that I love the chartreuse um, in the garden and I think it really pops. Maybe I wanna to try to get some more chartreuse into the garden. So it's a time to see if plants are performing well in the spot where they are. Do they need to be moved? This is not a time of year to move plants. We're heading into the hot weather of the summer here. And even though we are in uh, the northwest corner of Connecticut, the ice box, we get some hot, humid weather in the summertime. And it stresses plants terribly if you try to move them in that heat. So I'm really making notes to myself for things I might want to move in the fall, or in some cases, next spring. Um, and by the way, this is, this is the garden bed that you remember was, was pretty bare in one of the first videos we did, and you see how fully it's, it has come in. So I'm, I'm really proud of this, this two-year-old border. So a couple things I know that I want to do, mental notes I'm making. I have no idea where this plant came from. This is called a silene, and it's really a, it's sort of a meadow plant, um, a native plant, and it looks like it owns the place, but I, I can't remember planting it, and I certainly don't remember planting anything that I thought would get that tall. Um, so it's a mystery, but I know that after it stops flowering um, and we head into the fall, I'm going to move it back a little bit so that it's not competing with this um, focal point, this, this um, tutor. Uh, I want the tutor to really have center stage, so I'm going to move this back. As we walk down the border, I've got a couple of other spots that I, I am making mental notes about.
This spot where I'm standing is frankly kind of a conundrum. It's a, you can see it's a large spot. It backs up to this Rose of Sharon, which uh, I rejuvenated and it's actually looking really, really good. I think it's gonna flower beautifully. I've got a couple of little hydrangeas here. This is uh, sort of a miscellaneous little azalea that was left over from my old nursery. Um, it actually sat in a pot for about three years until I finally decided, okay, you have the will to live, I'm gonna plant you. But this area, these, what I've realized is that the hydrangeas just are not going to get large enough to kind of hold court over this area. They are supposed to be, they could get up to four feet, but I can just tell from looking at them. Um, if the range is two to four feet, I think they're gonna stay closer to two. They just don't look good here. I'm thinking of moving the azalea um, over into the woodland bed where I think it will it will blend in better. Here it looks sort of native-y and this garden is, is a little bit more um, cultivated, I guess I would say. So I want to get that out and figure out something for back here. Question would be, um, should I put a shrub back here? Is there something that can take this much shade and potentially compete with the roots from the Forsythia and the Rose of Sharon? Or should I do some really big perennials? And um, at the nursery where I work, we have some Simi Suffuga, which is a big, tall, um, it gets a big, tall, white spike fragrant. And I can imagine a stand of maybe five of those back here. They would die back um, at the end of the season, so I wouldn't have anything structural here to look at in the winter. And that's, that's the dilemma. So that's just, again, something that I have to think about and, uh, but won't actually physically probably be resolving that problem until the fall or maybe even next spring. Well all, thanks for joining us in my garden today. And we'll see you next time on New Digs. <laughs>